Well, thank you. I, I have to say, I feel that we, uh, all of us who've come from outside of the country, have had a wonderfully warm welcome. I've really enjoyed all the traditional um, celebrations that we've had, and this place is just amazing. So I, I would thank you all very, very much for that. Um, and thanks to Chris and Alistair and that amazing ball of energy, which is Ken, for inviting me to speak. I'm very much aware that I'm very privileged to be standing here amongst a, a group of people who have such incredible experiences themselves. Um, and I thank you very much for being able to hear your very honest and, and powerful moments, particularly those uh, that were shared by some of the survivors yesterday. Um, and just to add to that before we start, part of my work um, has been to review the deaths uh, and serious injuries of children involved in uh, child sexual exploitation. And what I'd like to say is that part of this presentation contains some of their experiences. These are the people who are not the survivors, um, and these are the people that I would like to remember uh, uh, as part of what we do here as well. So if I can get it to work. Oh, there you go. So, uh, I, I, I worked for the uh, Child Exploitation and Online Protection Centre for six years, and I still cannot move from one slide to another. Um, but yeah, hopefully I'll, I'll, I'll get a bit of a, a better grip of it as we go along. Where do we begin with what appears to be quite a new problem? I'd suggest that it actually isn't, but I would suggest that the awareness of child sexual exploitation is quite new to us. And it's become very much a national and an international concern for most countries, including this one. There are four models of uh, child sexual exploitation, but today we're concentrating particularly on organized and networked uh, CSE. And that means the, what possibly was previously known as sex work for children, prostitution, rent boys, those kind of horrible pieces of terminology that should never apply to children. Um, and it is saying that that's what we're concentrating on today. Most models uh, in terms of understanding CSE and those that look at the supportive environments and what we do for children involved in that focus yet again on the experience for girls and young women. And some of that's partly because of the historical development around CSE in general and seeing young women as being those involved in sex work that was maybe coerced and seeing young men involved in sex work that they quite liked or enjoyed. And I'm afraid there is still part of that myth uh, that, that hangs around. And it's really important that we understand that what happens within CSE for children and young people is a crime. It's always a crime. Uh, these children are being raped. These children are being sexually assaulted. They are being, and that is happening on a daily basis, sometimes by three, four, five more offenders per day. Uh, it's like a, uh, almost a factory of things. It's some of the worst crimes that you can ever see. And some of those uh, crimes include fatalities. And I think we have to say, there is a real need for us to understand the justice concepts behind this and what those people involved in this are, are entitled to. It's difficult enough to get justice for children, but it's particularly difficult in, in these very complex circumstances. We look at global concerns first, and I think sometimes we're, we're, we're often obsessed with the fact that uh, children are taken from one country to another, particularly a poorer country into a richer country, and that's what we're looking at when we're looking at CSA. Well, that's not necessarily the case, and if you look, for example, at the statistics in the United Kingdom, nearly half of all the children involved in CSE are involved internally, are moved from place to place across the country, and not coming in uh, from, from outside. 
We also have to understand that this is primarily a, a piece of uh, exploitation which is for economic gain by those who seek to, to push this forward. And you can see that you're looking at a huge gain because you're looking at around about 70% profit per head per per child. It's really important that, that we understand that like, this is not something that people are going to give up easily just because we tell them that it causes harm. This is something that's going to take a lot more than that. It coexists often with firearms and drugs, which means that we have people with quite uh, well-developed and sophisticated networks of moving things from one side to the other and that that is covert in, in many cases. It's also something that we never need to forget that we've got a huge financial impact upon our global economy and upon what happens to us. So even if people can put to the back of their minds the issues for children and what could be termed in, in some senses the sob stories, even if people can put that to their mind, they need to face facts that our economy is, is losing out to the tune of £99 billion per year as a result of trafficking. Human trafficking is the second largest gener generator of illicit funds. It only stands behind drugs. And it's very important that we take into account that then those children that become commodities in it are of huge worth as that commodity, not as a child, not as a human being, but as that commodity. I've made this very small writing, so I do hope that you can see it, because I'm struggling. <laughs> Let's think about what, why are we looking, and we are looking at an increase in CSE. What's that all about? Well, a lot of that is about human movement across the world. We've never seen so much of it, really, in short. Um, migration is, is one thing, but more, uh, more risky, uh, are the forms of smuggling and trafficking. Smuggling is where you pay somebody or, or you are involved in a contract for them to bring you from one country to another uh, uh, and that is not against your will. Whereas trafficking is, is against your will. That's the simplified version of that. However, in terms of children, UK law, for example, says that you cannot uh, move a child with their free consent. So uh, it, it does, if you're looking at CSE, we might be able to smuggle families, might be able to smuggle parents, but if a child goes with them, we would say that that's trafficking of, of, of that child. However, smuggling and trafficking are both risks. And the issue around smuggling not being an offence is not the same in many other countries. So we see, for example, um, and at the bottom, these uh, particularly difficult circumstances that we're facing in Europe around children uh, stacked in ports in Calais and children on the streets in Greece, which is really becoming quite problematic, uh, particularly for those children. Lots of these children are escaping conflict. They're not coming for, you, you know, well, I'll make a few extra quid if I go and get a job in the UK rather than have a job somewhere else. No, what they're coming for is a better life, and that better life often is a response to the potential that they may lose their lives wherever they are or that their families may lose their lives in, in the country that they currently live. And Ken said... What about New Zealand? And we all went, Ooh, well, we best have a look at that. And uh, what's interesting, TIP is um, the uh, trafficking, um, gosh, it's gone from my mind. Trafficking in Persons Report, 2017. Thank you very much. Um, if anybody else can join in as, as well. If I, if I forget anything, or just bring it on, it's quite, it's fine. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, New Zealand is a destination country, and it's been known that New Zealand's been a destination country since 2014. This is not news to you. 
That's what I'm saying. If you're here in New Zealand, this is not news. You've known for three years, so there's no excuses, is what I'm saying. Um, uh, one of the things that you're, uh, you've got three things that the TIP from 2017 suggests that you need to improve. That's the identification of vulnerable victims, the providing shelter for those victims, and then raising awareness. So I hope part of what we're doing today is contributing at least to that awareness raising. Um, you've also got recommendations that are about increasing resources for robust victim protection services. And you very clearly, and it is stated loudly and clearly in the TIP from 2017, that they are very keen to see services with regard to boys and men. And what I felt about that when I read that, I, th I thought, well, that's brilliant. And I hope that awareness has come somewhere from some of the stuff that is already happening here. And, and that, that's meant that people over, with some oversight and looking at what's happening have realised that there might be services for boys and men with regard to other things, but this is, this is where they're looking for you to establish those services. Um, this concerned me. A small number. I have no idea what a small number means. If anybody would like to have a guess at a small number, they are perfectly welcome to. But given that we have no ideas about how many children here might be involved in trafficking, it's very difficult then for us to say, well, what's this small number all about? What are we looking at? But here we go again. A small number of Pacific Island and New Zealand-born uh, children uh, boys and girls are at risk of trafficking. And look at this as well. These are children mainly of Maori descent. So when we're talking about services and those services needing to go in, and we were talking yesterday about like how those services can go in very specifically around the different, uh, uh, the different cultural needs and the different understanding that children have. You know, it's very, very important that we take on board these particular issues. There are particular risks for those children, and that is just going to climb unless we start to see some management uh, uh, of, of supportive services. Uh, the, 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 in, in case you don't hear it throughout the presentation, I'll just say it now. Prevention is the name of my game. I'm quite, quite happy to, to put stuff up and say this is, this is what the issues are, but it's with the aim, hopefully, that that drives people in here towards some sense of prevention for children, helping to understand the risks and concentrating on that. Um, in terms of trafficking and smuggling and how this relates then, how do, how do children then uh, who are trafficked or smuggled get into this world of CSE? Well, one of the things they do is they join gangs, the, particularly where children are separated from parents and carers. You'll see children band together, particularly if you put them in things like refugee camps, uh, and that's probably the effect we're starting to see uh, in Europe. Uh, it's not just the fact that they join in with those gangs, it's then that some children who may be perceived as weaker can be then exposed to those gangs and the potential harm that that might bring. They enter into violent and, and abusive relationships with the exploiters themselves. So on top of being forced to engage uh, in, in sex with, with other people that they don't really want to do, they're also forced to engage in sex with those exploiters, sometimes as a method of control and sometimes um, because the, the exploiters take advantage of the fact that those children are just there. Um, we talked a little bit about smuggling and, and, and illegal entry, so I won't to talk about that much further. Street work. Children start to engage in street work. It's survival. Street work exposes you to street risks. If you're a child on the street for any reason, you're a child exposed. You're a child exposed to drugs, 
you were a child exposed to adults and dangerous adults at that and unsafe situations. Here comes another one. Let's talk about humanitarian influence. And that might not apply so much in your domestic context, but it certainly does if any of you are thinking of uh, working abroad or for those uh, international uh, people that we've got, we've got visiting here today. The, when the humanitarians arrive in any situation, in any country, sexual abuse goes up. That's what happens. Just does. Surprise, surprise. Because where do the humanitarians come from? They come from countries like ours, and we know by the experience of our survivors that there are sexual abusers within our countries, and they will look for opportunity to, to abuse children. You'll also find it uh, where things happen, like, you know, if you get a, a, a sporting bid that becomes accepted, and this pops back to your uh, issues here, Ken, about people in sport not being, not being regulated as well, and possibly then people around that sport. You get somebody, you get a lot of people who come in, uh, cheap labour to come and build stadiums, you'll see the same effect. The risks are the greater, and the demand is there, and then you'll get the supply that follows. One of the things that I really uh, you, you know, we had a saying about, we've talked very uh, earlier on in, in the last couple of days about Jimmy Savile. And we, we said in the UK, th there was this saying, they said, oh, um, he's hiding, in, he hid in plain sight. He was an abuser who, who was so out there. He was doing it in front of everybody. But he was, he was hiding because he was able to, be, to, to, to do so. Uh, but he didn't need to kind of like do that surreptitiously. He was just there. And that's what we've got with our children. They're hiding in plain sight. You can see them if you go and have a look. And particularly for young people who've got uh, uh, gender, sexuality, or risk styles attached to their identity that fit an exploitation profile. They're just there. You can see them. It's not that difficult to find them. They, they're really not difficult to see. Particularly for young men who identify as gay, bisexual, or transgender, we know that they report, and they report, not us finding it from them, they are reporting to us that there is a higher incidence of CSE for them. They report more often, and what they report alongside of that CSE is previous familial uh, and, and peer physical abuse. So we're talking about children who, you, you know, if you listen to, to Norm's presentation where he says, you, you know, I came from a background where, where there was physical abuse, and that left me vulnerable to, to you know, and we hear that a lot, um, and that's what's happening as well with many of our young men. We, we hear again uh, this thing about the perceptions of weakness in certain styles or, 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 or certain behaviours are perceived or made to make uh, males be perceived as weak. And those then are often, those are, those are then often uh, characteristics of a child that then become targeted by an exploiter because they're seen as, as, as weaker. Uh, they're seen as more needy. Um, some identities are considered more sexually acceptable. Some exploiters will say, well, you know, we'll, we'll, have, we'll have young gay men. That's all right. And they're seen as sexually acceptable. So you'll see that maybe in some circumstances, you'll see more gay men being targeted by specific exploiters. And we're back again to this issue of survival. A lot of this for young people and for young men involved in CSE is about their very survival. It's about how you stay alive in terms of your physicality, but also how you survive mentally and psychologically. This isn't a choice. This is, and sometimes young men will then develop what they perceive to be a profile that might offer them some protection 
within, within an environment. So, and then we have some glorious statistics from, from the UK. And these are statistics from an organization called Bernardo's um, in the UK. And they are currently seeing between 11 and 20, well, they, they are currently researching, the, the outcomes of their research is that between 11 and 29% of CSE victims in the UK are boys and young men. But then funnily enough, 33% of boys and young men are accessing their CSE services. Well, that tells us a different picture altogether, doesn't it? Because what we know is that boys and young men are less likely to access services than girls and young women. And yet we see a third of them accessing those services, despite the fact that I think we can clearly say that, you know, those services are actually more or less designed for young women rather than young men in the main. So, so this choice of, of these young men accessing it, I think shows us a, a more serious picture. Um, and I think that's probably likely uh, to be across the piece. Boys are more likely to be younger than girls when they first become victims. And again, it's that, that vulnerability and, and that risk and identifying that at an earlier stage uh, for boys and young men. Also, what we know about children with disabilities, and uh, you know, I've, I've only put a little bit in here because otherwise I'll be on here for three days and you'll all be like snoozing away. And if, uh, I mean, unless you are already, we'll just be careful about that. But, uh, boys who are victims are more likely, so in the, if, you, if you look at the group of victims who are boys and the group of victims who are girls, this group over here of boys, they're more likely to have disabilities and their disabilities are more likely to be uh, behavioural-based problems. Now, you can, you can start to join up the dots, because if you've got boys and young men who are mainly being made vulnerable by serious physical uh, abuse within the home or other abuses within the home, what's going to happen to them? They're, they're, I would use a, a nice scouse phrase, they're going to kick off. And if they kick off, right, we're going to see them as having behavioural problems. So what have we got in this group over here? It's, not, it's no big surprise, and the dots join up quite neatly, sadly. Um, and, and obviously, offending behaviour is higher in, in male CSE victims and survivors. And again, this translates if you've got behavioural difficulties or you're looking at risk-taking profiles. That, you know, that, that's going to happen. So the, it, it's kind of, a, it's almost a perfect storm to put our children and young people, our boys and our young men, into this environment because it's going to cause them great harm and it's actually going to translate into harm for our society. And this was a, a, a nicely interesting uh, fact that also uh, came out of the Bernardo's research is that female perpetrators are more likely to target boys than girls. So despite the fact that the majority of offenders do, do remain male, those female per, uh, perpetrators involved in exploitation are looking for boys. I've put this um, slide up because it's kind of it's almost in terms of the way uh, 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 law enforcement and criminality can start to think around particularly young men involved in CSE. Lots of young people uh, uh, end up as facilitators. They kind of almost move from, from one side to the other. And that's not about, um, that's about bringing other young people in. Now, that's the way CSE works. That's not, that it is not a criminal offence in, it, in its own right if it is coerced. It should not be, because that, it, what you're looking at is a child being coerced by an exploiter to take on behaviour that reduces the risk for the exploiter because you're getting the child to do it the, or the young person to do it. However, when this happens, we're much more likely to see uh, that coercion for girls. 
and we say, you, 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 you know, that girl, we, we'll, we'll look at different ways uh, of uh, diverting from, from criminality with regard to the facilitation. We don't, we don't do that in the same way for boys. And we say about boys uh, that they are, um, they, 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 they become criminalized. They are diverted less. Um, assessment, therefore, becomes really crucial in terms of us being able to understand what we need to look at for our children and young people. It is absolutely crucial to look at the whole strengths-based model assessment around young people when we think that they are involved in CSE. And uh, I almost, you, you know, I think you, you get involved in some of the, uh, the larger scale inquiries into uh, child sexual exploitation. And you begin to wonder when you see the cost to people of going through the justice channels, well, what's, what's the importance of this? Because there's a great cost involved, uh, both to adult survivors um, and to children themselves. Uh, and, and so, well, what's the importance? Well, the first thing is, is we need to hold offenders to account because the survivor needs to be able to hold offenders to account. It's their right, should they choose to do so. And it is society's right to, to, to punish and deter offenders from taking part in this behaviour. And that, I think, is a very important. But the other issue about justice is about being believed. And uh, it, there's, a, there's a lot of discussion goes on about whether law enforcement do believe people who give an account particularly the more complex that account is or, or, or the more extraordinary that account is. And some of these accounts are particularly extraordinary. But we've adopted a, a, a model within um, Operation Stovewood, which is the CSE inquiry that I work on currently, where we believe everybody. And it's our job to investigate their complaint. If you uh, were the victim of a burglary I wouldn't say to you, well, you could have turned your house over yourself. I'm not really quite sure whether or not uh, this is a real complaint, really, for me. That, that's a cop-out. It's an absolute cop-out. If you make a complaint about anything, including sexual assault, you have the right for it to be investigated, and you have the right to be taken seriously and believed. But it also starts you on the road to recovery if it's done correctly. Um, and it can, build, it, it can build in support to help a, a survivor or young person to build resilience because it, it, it takes this belief and it develops that and it gives some credence and credibility to it from, from an authoritarian and a societal perspective. And it also goes to the protection of others. And I think for many young people in particular that I've worked with, one of the things that they want to do is not, they know in, to some extent that they're not able to stop it for themselves, but they want to prevent other people going through that, other children being targeted the way that, that they were. And even where there's not a successful prosecution, those things can be very important and they can be done. Um, we know, we know this is a well-trotted out, you know, boys are less likely to report all types of child sexual abuse. Um, and their, uh, their reports are also less likely to result in a successful prosecution. And it's just to add to that, that adult survivors have the same issues. So adult males who report child sexual abuse are less likely than adult women to have a case progress to prosecution or conviction. And some of the questions that's, that, are, that is some of the questions that are currently being asked within that literature are around credibility and about how we understand the credibility of boys and young men um, and adult males when they make uh, uh, allegations around sexual abuse. And what's the problem here? What's the difference between an eight-year-old girl and an eight-year-old boy who give you the same story? Well, 
who knows, but there is one. And that goes right up to adulthood. Doesn't change. Um, I hark back to what I know about the uh, UK uh, Achieving Best Evidence System. Um, and there is a model um, from the National Institute of Child Health and Development in the, uh, in the States. And the, the kind of combination of those systems is replicated globally. You have it here. You have a very similar uh, system there. And our systems involve, it mean that where you've got vulnerable and, t and intimidated witnesses, so for example, those under the, eight, uh, under the age of 18 who've witnessed sexual crimes, they can be supported by this system. Um, and the system is open to those complaining historically. So you have as much right to say that you were abused when you were six, when you're 56 or 106, as you have when you're six. And it's important to know that, that you know, that's, that, that's your right. However, and here comes the, the lovely bit, because there's always a however, isn't there, with, with child protection. Despite that system running in the UK since 1992, we know that the reports of child sexual abuse have risen and that the rates of successful prosecution have fallen alongside that rise. So actually, we're doing really, really badly. It's mirrored to some extent in some of the work in the Royal Commission. And we are, we are getting worse at this, not better. And that's quite staggering, really, because how do we support, how on earth can we support those more complex cases, those people who are 56 or 106 and who have a right to complain, when we can't get it right for, for, for a, a general case where we've had all of that experience and expertise since 1992. What we do know at this early stage, and I hope it is an early stage of how we look at it, is that poor interviewing, uh, poor interviewing practice is a major problem. Despite the fact that we educate and train our police officers and we give them uh, the... the, the, the rules and regulations and how to do it and how not to ask leading questions and what they still do what they should not do and they don't plan very well for um for, for interviewing and we've still got problems so what makes a better system now this is the this is probably the uh, the simplest uh kind of uh approach that I, I that I can that I can I could boil this down to and this is again uh, the the model that we're operating to and we've built for Stovewood and we are having some success with it I mean what that will look like over the longer term we, we we don't know yet because we've not tested but but what we are looking at as I say is is a much better model and this is with adult survivors who told their stories over and over again and were, um, were ignored by the authorities. And so we are looking at the uh, complaints being made from 1997 onwards. Uh, and as I say, we are managing some success as a result. And it starts with this strength-based assessment of, of needs. This is no more than is actually written in ABE. It's just put together in a building block that says this is what you have to do. You can't just do one little bit or not do it at all. So you need a strengths-based assessment of need. You need to look at safety and safeguarding and that should be built around the whole process from the time at which somebody comes in through the door of a police station or an agency like ours from that point right the way through to the closure of that interview you need to have considered safety and safeguarding at all of those points it's not magic it, it, it can happen and then the other area is to to develop your interview planning for those for those people who are doing this kind of work 
it is absolutely crucial to have a look at the inquiry that you are undertaking and to have that planning uh, focused in on that particular person and the, and the particular complaint that they are making. Generic forms around assessment, generic forms around safeguarding, generic forms around interview planning are not really going to do you any favours. And, and I think it's that that has, you know, we love to have a form. We love to have a form that says, oh, you can do it like this. <laughs> but actually that doesn't work. And these are the things that we know that we've got the expertise in and we should be doing that. You'll be pleased to know that this is the summary of the, of the presentation. Is that? I was just saying, migration, smuggling and trafficking involving young men is perpetuating a market and it's creating tomorrow's survivors. Now we're all sat in this room talking about how difficult um, and how raw and how emotional and um, how deep those issues run. And they live with you, but they're gonna take you from the cradle to the grave. You know, do we wanna create any more of that? That's not where we wanna be if we can help it. So we need to start looking at better ways to protect children and better ways to focus on what the specific needs are for those differences amongst us. Differences between girls and boys, differences between gay and straight, differences between trans and non-trans, all of those things. You, you know, we need to start focusing on that and differences in our, in our cultures. It is a global and a national responsibility. So people have got agendas, governments have got agendas on this. You need to, we all need to contribute to that agenda. It's part of our responsibility to make sure that uh, we don't create another generation after generation after generation of survivors if we can help those who are out there now. Survival and becoming involved in uh, sexual exploitation or whatever else people would like to term it, sex work or whatever, whatever you want to call that, that does not mean consent, either sexually or criminally. Being forced to have sex some, with somebody else does not mean consent. And if that is through a process of exploitation, however much you look like you are consenting to it, you are doing so for your survival. And we need to take that out of the picture. We need to stop saying that children have consented, consented to having sex with people who are exploiting them or people who are introducing them through those exploiters. Um, young men in certain circumstances are, are more vulnerable. You, you all know that probably better than I. Um, and we need to enable access to justice. And one of the best ways that we can do that is through more supportive and better interviewing, giving the people, giving people, children and adults, the right to give their account more effectively so they can get what they want out of that process is crucial. Um, and service development across prevention of, of child sexual exploitation. It, I, I've put poor, I mean dire. I mean, Ken, what's your New Zealand word? Is it shit? That's what I mean by that. Um, uh, and it starts to need, this service prevention needs to target the issues for boys and young men um, because the prospects otherwise for those boys and young men mean long-term exploitation for them in, into adulthood and, and criminalization. Um, and so thank you very much for your time.